Tonight, a major overhaul of how alcohol is sold in Ontario. We got to treat our, our people of Ontario like adults. The change that will land booze in corner stores across the province. They didn't speak to anybody who's out there as part of a safety net to protect this province. And the concerns over that convenience. Calls for a ceasefire reveal cracks in the Liberal Party. I was very disappointed in the vote at the United Nations. At issue breaks down the growing division. And the impact of forcing French at Quebec universities. I can only view this as a targeted attack on institutions that have been part of Quebec. Necessary change or devastating deterrent. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. Alcohol is about to start flowing more freely for 15 million Canadians. Ontario is overhauling its rules about where booze can be sold. The major change, convenience stores will be allowed to get in on the action, along with some gas stations and other outlets. But it will all take time, and not every kind of alcohol is covered. Mike Crawley first broke this story. He takes us through why the change is being met with celebration in some corners and concern in others. Oh, this is a good one, Georgian Hills. The bottles of wine in this convenience store aren't for sale yet. They're just a highlight, a major change to how Ontarians will be able to buy alcohol. I'm not a drinker, but I'm tempted to go back there, crack up one of those, uh, whatever they are, ciders, and take a little swig. Right now, Ontario has fewer shops per capita selling alcohol than anywhere in Canada. Once Doug Ford's plan kicks in, only Quebec and Newfoundland and Labrador would have more. We've got to treat our, our people of Ontario like adults, and that's what we're doing. The changes mean nearly 7,000 convenience stores in Ontario could become licensed. Convenience stores do this in other parts of the country, notably Quebec. They've been doing it for decades. We are very responsible retailers. We have a solid track record. And for the first time in Ontario, privately owned stores would be allowed to sell beer and wine at prices lower than the provincially owned liquor stores. This is a good day for the consumer to have choice, uh, to have convenience and to, uh, to have competition. None of this actually happens today or any day soon. Ontario's contract with the multinational owned beer store limits how many retail shops can sell alcohol in the province for another two years. But in 2026, the new stores will give Ontario's craft brewers more places to sell their products. This is one of the biggest changes to beer in Ontario since Prohibition in 1927. Same goes for Ontario's wineries. Frankly, it's transformational for, for our industry. Despite the celebratory mood here, Others have concerns about the government's move to widen access to alcohol. They spent a lot of time talking to the people who buy beer, sell beer and make beer. They didn't speak to anybody who's out there as part of a safety net to protect this province. So Mike, uh, we're talking about freer uh, access, but still some pretty tight restrictions on some alcohol. Yeah, so spirits like whiskey or rum only going to be available at the government-run LCBO. And the beer store gets to control distribution of beer to bars, restaurants, and all those new retail outlets. This is something Doug Ford, the Premier, has been wanting to do for a long time. Yes, since before he became Premier. It was one of his election campaign promises in 2018. And interestingly, as you heard in that item, Doug Ford doesn't personally drink, but he's a big fan of free markets. So liberalizing Ontario's retail market for booze fits with his politics, and according to a lot of polls, is really popular with voters too. All right, Mike Crawley, thank you. There's tension in Quebec tonight where learning French will soon become a requirement for most university students. That ruling comes alongside a substantial tuition hike. And as Alison Northcott shows us, those barriers to entry have some choosing to go elsewhere. Leaders at McGill University call the government's decision devastating. I can only view this as a targeted attack on institutions that have been part of Quebec and that have contributed to Quebec for hundreds of years. That decision, increasing tuition fees for out-of-province students from around $9,000 a year to $12,000. That's less than its original proposal to nearly double those fees, but Montreal's English universities say it's still a big blow. For many of our programs, uh, students will be paying twice what they would be paying in the rest of Canada. The universities will also face a new requirement. 80% of students will need to be able to speak French at an intermediate level by the time they graduate, or the school could lose provincial funding. 
McGill calls that target academically impossible, but Quebec's Minister of Higher Education says it's a necessary goal. I think it's achievable. I think it's something that we can manage. And those measures we're putting in forward is not an attack to Anglos. I mean, it's really because in, in Montreal, we have a decline of French. We need to do something about it. Both my um, siblings go there, um, so I've visited quite a few times. This Ontario high school student applied to McGill, but she's having second thoughts. A tuition hike is still a tuition hike. Um, that's still a lot of money. Um, and yeah, I think learning French would be great but not to the point where it will be taking up, you know, the other studies I want to be doing. The government says Bishop's University in Sherbrooke will have some exemptions from the tuition hikes. This announcement is a great relief for Bishop's University as this was really an existential question for us. Both McGill and Concordia say applications from out-of-province students have dropped by 20% since the tuition increases were first announced in October. They worry those could drop even more now. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. One year after a series of scandals, multiple key sponsors are coming back to Hockey Canada. Tim Hortons, TELUS and ESSO are all reinstating their support ahead of this month's World Junior Championships. They pulled it last year following an uproar over how the organization was handling sexual assault complaints. Hockey Canada is now under new leadership and has brought in new measures aimed at improving the sport's culture and safety. The Speaker of the House of Commons will not have to resign after a controversial video that triggered angry calls from the opposition. But as Marina von Stackelberg shows us, there are new allegations tonight of rules broken, and they're not all aimed at the current Speaker. Greg Fergus started in his Speaker chair this morning, but then had to leave it so a report could be released on whether he should lose his job. A House of Commons committee recommends Fergus apologize and pay a fine, but not step down over this video message. It's such a great opportunity to speak about my longtime friend, John Fraser. Fergus in his speaker's office and clothing, paying tribute to the outgoing leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. The speaker is supposed to be impartial, a neutral referee. Now the Conservatives say this isn't the only time Fergus broke the rules. There is evidence of another partisan activity that the Speaker was engaged with. Conservative House Leader Andrew Scheer points to this Instagram post. It shows Fergus a month ago at an event for a Liberal member of Quebec's legislature. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is not even like the Speaker's honest. riding. This is a neighbouring riding. It's billed as a cocktail with activists or volunteers. Fergus's office responded, writing, the Speaker's attendance at this event precedes the introduction of a rigorous new protocol. Mr. Fergus was simply in attendance at this free event, which is in his riding. This comes after CBC News revealed Conservative Andrew Scheer broke Parliament's rules himself. I've gotten to know Arpan over the past few years. He was fined $500 earlier this year for using Parliament resources to film a video endorsing a Conservative by-election candidate. The NDP points to Scheer attending multiple Conservative fundraisers when he was Speaker during the previous Conservative government. The message has to be all speakers from now on, regardless of the party, cannot act in this, in this way, either partisan, wearing their robes, or uh, participating in a partisan fundraiser. While the NDP and the Liberals want Greg Fergus to keep his job, the Conservatives and the Bloc Québécois still want him out. This comes as the House of Commons is set to break at the end of this week, with MPs heading home to their ridings for the next six weeks. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. The Liberals and the NDP have agreed to extend their end-of-year deadline to pass new pharmacare legislation. The deal is part of an agreement between the two parties that entails the Liberals advancing NDP priorities in exchange for support on essential government votes. The new goal for a drug plan is now set for March the 1st. And the Senate has passed the Liberal government's gun control bill, clearing the way for it to become law. It will place restrictions on handguns, increase penalties for firearm trafficking, and it aims to curb homemade ghost guns. The legislation also includes a new definition for assault-style firearms meant to ban future models. A number of amendments to the bill were dropped earlier this year after backlash from some firearms rights groups. Despite more international pressure tonight to save civilians in Gaza, Israeli airstrikes are not relenting.
combat echoes through streets as people shelter in rain-soaked tent cities, some begging for bread. And as Sasha Petrosik shows us, the message from Israel's defense minister, there are several months of this to come. Israel's airstrikes, shelling and shooting intensified across Gaza, tearing down houses and claiming lives. Where's the ambulance? This boy is still alive, he yells, in a panic that's become frighteningly familiar. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for your support. It's also become increasingly uncomfortable for Israel's most powerful ally, the U.S., which sent a top national security official with America's message. I want them to be focused on how to save civilian lives, not stop going after Hamas, but be more careful. Israel's defense minister responded with predictions of a long, tough battle. Uh, it will take and require a long period of time. It will last more than several months, but we will win and we will destroy them. Israel released video of what it says are Hamas fighters surrendering in Gaza. But it also insists many other militants have dug in behind civilians. And life for those Palestinians has become unlivable, says the UN. Hundreds of thousands shivering in the cold and rain. Our tent is flooded, she says. No blankets, no mattresses. Doctors treating babies say conditions are so bad the diseases already circulating threaten to become epidemics. The lack of food risks starvation. People, and this is also something completely new, people are stopping at aid trucks, taking the food and eating it right away. And this is how desperate and hungry they are. And I witness this firsthand. And the growing desperation and rage may be fueling more support for Hamas. I pledge my body to the resistance, he yells, amid the wounded from continuing airstrikes. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Palestinian officials are calling Israeli raids in Jenin in the occupied West Bank a dangerous escalation. People gathered to mourn some of the 12 reportedly killed over the course of three days of fighting. The occupation is the cause of tragedies for both the Palestinian and Israeli people, says this man, whose nephew is among the dead. Israel says it's targeting terrorists in Jenin and that it dismantled a bomb-making lab. Residents say unarmed civilians were killed, homes damaged and vandalized. The opioid crisis has pushed a tiny Ontario community right to the edge. Its leaders have now declared a state of emergency desperate to save their neighbours' lives. Algonquins of Pequaknagon First Nations sit about an hour and a half west, drive west of Ottawa. Only about 500 people call it home. And as Nicole Williams shows us, this is a community grieving and afraid. Deep in the Ottawa Valley, members of the Algonquins of Pequaknagon First Nation are sounding the alarm. Officials recently declared a state of emergency. Drug overdoses are ravaging the community. We're losing too many uh, of our people to death and the people who end up in a, uh, having an overdose are that much closer to not surviving. Drug-related deaths have surged across the country since the pandemic, and the First Nation is no exception. Before 2020, it saw an average of five drug-related deaths a year. In the first six months of 2023, there were 12, a staggering loss in a community of just 500 people. And when someone hurts, we hurt. Michael Dustin Commando is a member of the First Nation and works there. He knows the impact of this crisis firsthand. I do have family that has um, drug addictions, and and I see no change of them getting better. So there's five steps to respond to the opioid overdose. The small team at the local health centre says they see roughly three overdoses a week, and with not enough resources, they're being pushed to the brink trying to get services out to people, trying to get out safe supplies, trying to educate. 
Declaring a state of emergency gives the First Nation access to government funding for addictions treatment and programming, partnerships with provincial and federal agencies to help form an action plan, and more police officers stationed in the community to help stem the flow and sale of drugs in and around the First Nation. The Quaktagon is not isolated. We're not, we don't have closed borders, we're quite open. The chief of Pickwock Nagan says this state of emergency will remain in place as long as is necessary until council feels like the situation is under control and community members are safe. Nicole Williams, CBC News, Pickwock Nagan, First Nation, Ontario. The man who caused the 2018 Humboldt bus crash could soon be deported to India. A federal judge has dismissed an argument by Jaskirat Singh Sidhu's lawyer who said the decision to deport him didn't consider his clean criminal record. Sidhu pleaded guilty to dangerous driving charges in the accident that killed 16 people and injured 13 others. As a permanent resident, Sidhu can still argue to stay in Canada on humanitarian and compassionate grounds. In Toronto tonight, there are renewed calls for police accountability to combat anti-black racism. It follows a long-awaited report detailing systemic discrimination. Ithil Musa now on the calls for action and accountability. The Ontario Human Rights Commission says its new report makes one thing clear. Systemic racial discrimination, racial profiling, and anti-black racism exist wherever black people interacts with Toronto Police Services. Random street checks, commonly known as carding, has been banned for years under most circumstances, but the Commission says this report proves the discriminatory practice is still happening in Toronto. Colloquially, we refer to those encounters as either driving while black, walking while black, the new report is the culmination of an inquiry launched in 2017. Now the commission is calling for the Toronto Police Service to make more than 100 recommendations legally binding, including collecting detailed information on all police stops, detentions and searches, and using race-based data to identify officers who are prone to racial profiling. This lawyer says enforcing those recommendations would bring much needed accountability. We don't just want acknowledgements and I'm sorry's that mean nothing. We need substance. I don't know. Journalist I, and I, author I, Desmond Cole says he's been stopped and questioned by Toronto police dozens of times. He says it will take much more to hold police accountable. The police budget is going up and up and up and up. Every year that we keep having the same conversation and having all of these reports, we are rewarding the police for harming and harassing black people. Toronto police say new rules are already in place adding, while we may already be on the path of change, more change is necessary and it must be sustained, comprehensive and deep. Still, it welcomes this report, acknowledging trust has been eroded over many years. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. An emboldened Vladimir Putin takes center stage to defend the war in Ukraine. But, you know, it will come to an end sooner or later. The questions he answered and the ones he dodged. The Israel-Hamas war is spilling out into the sea. Why cargo ships are now a bigger target. And Vancouver residents struggle to keep the lights on. I tried, I tried, I lost. We're back in two. Good evening, everyone. This is a historic moment. The European Council president excitedly announced the opening of negotiations with Ukraine on joining the European Union, a surprise shift after Hungary threatened to veto for weeks before choosing to abstain. Negotiations could take years, but the fact that Ukraine is on the road to joining the EU could be a blow to Vladimir Putin. Hours earlier, he went before the Russian public for a year-end question-and-answer session. Briar Stewart now on what he was asked and what he refused to answer. These are the kind of moments Vladimir Putin relishes. Front and center at a curated event designed to instill confidence. For more than four hours, Putin answered questions, including those carefully selected from the public. 
One came from an AI-generated image of himself as he was asked about whether or not he uses body doubles. A poke at the regular rumors that swirl online, suggesting Putin uses stand-ins. By the way, it's my first double, he replied. There were several questions about the economy and, of course, about Ukraine. Last year, the annual town hall was cancelled in the wake of mounting military losses. But this year, the situation is much different. After months of fighting, Ukraine's top general has admitted that Kyiv's counteroffensive failed to achieve its objectives. Financial and military support from the U.S., one of Ukraine's biggest backers, appears to be faltering. They have been uh, importing things for free, uh, freeloading, but, you know, it will come to an end sooner or later. Putin said it wasn't necessary to launch a new round of mobilization, but he was not asked when the hundreds of thousands of men who were sent to Ukraine can return home. In recent weeks, many Russian women have taken to social media demanding answers, like Victoria, who was angered she hasn't received any. We've agreed not to identify her for her own safety. They think we will remain silent and wait for a miracle, she said. People will not wait. This Russian law professor says the event wasn't designed to inform, but to send specific messages. Two things. I'm controlling everything and everything is okay. That's all. A reminder to Russians that the man who has been in power for more than two decades should stay there. And this spring, he will almost certainly be voted in once again. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. So let's bring in Rosie, who's here with us in studio, which is fantastic. I know you've brought the ad issue panel with you. Uh, What's on the table? Yeah, thrilled to be here and thrilled that they all came in to sit down and be around the table as well. We obviously talk about the end of this parliamentary sitting. It's been raucous. It's been chaotic. It's been a little bit dysfunctional. So where are we after a couple of uh, rocky weeks as they all go back to their writings? There's also the matter of, of Canada's call at the U.N. For the ceasefire. Yeah, that obviously a shifting foreign policy position and some Liberal MPs in that caucus not happy with the vote. I was very disappointed in the vote at the United Nations. How has Canada's vote for a ceasefire affected caucus unity for the Liberals? Chantal, Althea and Andrew join me to talk about that and more. That's next. Andre Brower's publicist has now confirmed he died of lung cancer, saying he was diagnosed a few months ago. The Emmy Award-winning actor is known for a wide range of roles, most recently on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. He died on Monday at the age of 61. Returning now to the Israel-Hamas war and fears it could expand following continuous attacks in the Red Sea. The Houthis, a Yemeni militant group aligned with Iran, are targeting ships. Chris Brown now with the impact of their offensive and the threat that still looms. Israel's foes are applying pressure wherever they can, and civilian shipping in the Red Sea has become more collateral damage to the war in Gaza. (laughs) Yemen's Houthi militias captured the galaxy leader and detained its crew in November, and the attacks have escalated since. This week, a Norwegian oil tanker was hit by anti-ship missiles and caught fire. Other commercial ships were shot at, but were undamaged. Houthi military leaders claim they're acting in solidarity with Palestinians. And that all of the targets have some connection to Israel, but that's far from clear. The actions that we've seen from these Houthi forces are destabilizing, they're dangerous, and clearly a a flagrant violation of international law. U.S., French and other naval vessels have shot down many of the drones and missiles, but with the attacks increasing, the United States is calling for a broad coalition to protect shipping. We have every reason to believe that these attacks, while they were launched by the Houthis in Yemen, were fully enabled by Iran. Iran also exerts control over Hezbollah militias to Israel's north in Lebanon. 
This former Yemeni ambassador to Canada says if Iran decides to expand the conflict, the bigger threat comes from Hezbollah, not the Houthis. The, if the Iranians decide that a war should erupt, should start in that region, it's Hezbollah who can do it, not the, not the Houthis. The Houthis can disrupt, as I said, the maritime traffic, but that's the maximum they can do. Shipping representatives stress the industry is very resilient. It has dealt with issues such as piracy around the Red Sea before, and some shipping companies are opting to sail around Africa instead, hoping that these attacks, while serious, can be contained. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Now, let's throw it over to Rosie with the Ad Issue panel. Ad Issue this week, a major shift in Canada's position on the Israel-Hamas war. Stroke L27 has been adopted. The UN passed a non-binding resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Canada voted in favour. In the face of an unfolding humanitarian catastrophe, we continue to call for a return to humanitarian causes. We're going to keep uh, participating in urgent international efforts towards a sustainable ceasefire. But that vote is causing tensions inside the Liberal caucus. I was very disappointed in the vote at the United Nations. Is the UN resolution a sign of shifting support for Israel and will it affect unity in the Liberal caucus? Hey everyone, I'm Rosemary Barton here to break it all down in person. Chantal Bear, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Good to see you all in person. Um, clearly, this was a shift uh, for the government, and, and I will say that there was a difference for uh, people inside the caucus, uh, Jewish MPs inside the caucus, between the statement the government made uh, with Australia, New Zealand, and us versus the vote in the UN, because they found those to be obviously not complimentary uh, policy moves. What did you make of that? And the statement the foreign minister put out on Twitter afterwards. Yeah. Yes. in which they listed all the things that should be listed of Hamas should lay down its arms, Hamas should release the hostages. Hamas is the, both the cause of this and the, the, could, could end it if it did, chose to do so today. So to put it all on Israel is this resolution. This resolution, which was not brought in good faith by people who were trying to mediate it, but was brought by a bunch of countries that, are, that have always been hostile to Israel, for Canada to sign on to this, I mean, abstaining from it is one thing, which has been our historic norm, but to suddenly and unannounced suddenly sign on to this thing, I think is a terrible betrayal. Um, it, well, I will say, it, to, to, to compound matters, at the same time as the Liberals were doing this on Israel, we had the Conservatives look, go, looking like they're going wobbly on Ukraine. This was not a good week for Canada as a constructive international player. And, and yeah, Chantal. I have a bit uh, of a different take. I, uh, there were tensions within caucus yes. uh, before that. I believe that if Canada had voted for a resolution like this three weeks ago, uh, there would have been resignations from the Liberal caucus. People would have left over it. That didn't happen. I'm not convinced that it's going to happen. Uh, and I thought there was a bit of a one-two punch here that... Uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, that statement was really meant to signal that they were going to vote the way they voted in the, the national, the, the, in the General Assembly at the UN. But um, only nine countries supported Israel. Only one of those was the US, uh, the only G7 country uh, that actually supported Israel in the, in the yes. General Assembly. Now, normally, I would have expected the President of the United States to reiterate his support for Israel. That is not what happened. The sequence was this vote took place with these countries, including Canada, voting the way they did. And Joe Biden came out and said uh, the current government of Israel is losing international support. It was as if the allies of the U.S. were providing an illustration for how much support Israel is losing internationally. And I do believe that the fact no one has resigned from caucus when they would have three weeks ago or a month ago is also a sign that what has been happening in Gaza uh, is making it harder to support the way that the Israel government is conducting that battle. Yeah. On Ukraine, I totally agree with Andrew. Uh, it was a weird spectacle. The, the, the resignations piece, it, it definitely was on the table, I think, for some people, uh, according to what I heard, um, Althea. I, I, I don't know that it still is. But I wonder if, if this is also because there were a lot of people in caucus who were, who were decrying what was happening in Gaza for many weeks and not getting the attention, uh, perhaps, that they wanted from their own party. I hope there's not any resignation in caucus because 
I hope that there is a space for people to disagree and still remain united. I think it would be really sad, just personally speaking, to have MPs decide that because on this issue they can't stay. Because what we're seeing is, outside on the streets, people seem to be getting more and more entrenched in their positions. Yeah. Um, the reason the government changed its vote, I believe, is because last time the same vote happened at the UN, um, they tried to bring forward an amendment, and the amendments need two-thirds in order to pass. And it got the majority, but it didn't get, it didn't get two-thirds to add um, a condemnation of Hamas in the, in the motion. And it, this happened again uh, this week. And I think they knew that that was going to happen, and that's why, to Chantal's point, Israel, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada came out in order to kind of add an asterisk to their vote. But how their vote played out several weeks ago was that it seemed like Canada was in favor of allowing the killing of innocent women and children. And they didn't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think those arguments started to get more and more credence. And I think the other thing that happened is that Israel made it difficult for Canada to side with Israel. When you have the ambassador of Israel to the UK come out on TV and say, we do not believe in a two-state solution, sure. there should not be a, a Palestinian state living next to Israel, that makes it hard for Canada that has a two-state solution to say that, that you know, we abide by that. And it gives credence to people who do believe that this is a genocide, that Israel wants to wipe Gaza off the map. And so I think it, that is the reason why the government changed it. But, but does it mean that Canada cannot help uh, engage with Israel now because it's taken. Well, yeah. We're, but we're not the major player no, there. No, uh, no. The major player is the U.S. Yeah, yeah. And what the U.S. needs is pressure uh, that it can bring on the current government of Israel. Let's be serious. There were massive demonstrations in Israel against the Netanyahu yeah. uh, government over the past few weeks. So I, when I watch the Canadian position and the American position, my take isn't that they fell apart, uh, they're apart from each other, it's that they are all putting pressure but they're moving uh, in the rec, to the try direction. to get a, a regime change in Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we can separate the, the current government of Israel and its stance on things like the two-state solution from the prosecution of the war against Hamas, on which there can also be reasonable differences of opinion of, of exactly how it's being prosecuted. But the principle that Israel is not only entitled to, but obliged to defend its citizens from this monstrous threat on its border, and that doing so requires taking Hamas out of commission, mm -hmm. and that in doing so, in prosecuting a war, inevitably there will be civilian casualties. Uh, it, the, the, the people seem to be trying to say, to say that Israel, alone amongst countries on Earth, has only the right to defend itself if it doesn't cause any casualties. I don't think that's that, what I think, I think that's just I, I, remarkably no. uh, uh, one-sided. I think that is the way that some will frame it. But others will say that, that getting rid of Hamas is a worthy goal that Canada supports, but it's also consideration has to be given in how you do that. Yeah, you, if you told everybody to go to the south and you start bombing in the south and there is no place, no safe place for people to live where there is going to be famine and there yeah. could be cholera, you know, it, name, it, I think name it's me another normal country, for, Name me another country in the prosecution of a war that tells people where it's going to be dropping bombs. This, it, but, it, but, this is unique. But, the, but if there's but nowhere to go... Them in, in any I, event, I, I, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, I, what Joe Biden had to say about the way the war is conducted uh, is literally the Canadian position. Yeah. The, the only difference is the vote in the UN, but bottom line, in substance, Canada and the US are saying the same thing. The way the war is being conducted is... Um, it, 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 is, is, is exacting too many civilian casualties sure. that cannot be Israel uh, should be held to the standards of international law. Everyone reasonably should agree with that. I don't agree they should be held to a different standard unique to Israel, which is well, what seems to be happening. The UNGA motion actually just says that. So it doesn't matter because it's just a symbol. It yeah. is non-binding. It will mean nothing. Right. It is but, certainly but, not going to change Israel. What is interesting yeah. is all the caveats also that the liberals went to great lengths to put, some of which are, you know, no uh, Palestinian state with Hamas in the leadership. Yeah. Does that even mean then that there will not be a democratic vote? Because you could call Hamas something else, but will, you know, will the international community be deciding yeah. who rules over a free I, Palestine? I, yeah. I, like, yeah, I, I mean, we yeah. were getting ahead of ourselves, sure, but sure. It, is, it is interesting how they have tried to couch their position but, so that 
that they can please as many people sure, as they but, can but, please. But if, if this is the world concern turning in this direction, as we all yeah. seem to, to, to agree on at least that point, and Israel is not responsive to that. I, I just don't know what, what happens in but, terms but of But, the, but there are democratic forces in play uh, in Israel. It's not for us to sit and say no. Israel, because a specific government is acting, uh, a sure. controversial government yes. is acting in one way. That is not Israel in the same way that uh, That's right. yes, uh, yes. Premier Legault is not Quebec. No. But uh, have you ever seen a foreign policy issue that is so seized Canadian politics, no, including no, people no, no. on the it's streets, so divided, yeah. people, sure. uh, it, it yeah. is in a league of its own. Yeah. It including people who have no tie to yeah. the... Right. It would certainly be the best thing for Israel's war effort to have a different government. There, there cannot be a less persuasive spokesman for the Israeli cause than Benjamin Netanyahu. Okay. Uh, we're going to leave this topic there. That, that was, was easier to do in person, that topic. Than <laughs> that's a hard one. Yeah. When we return, we're going to take a look at the current state of Canada's parliament. I don't want to insult Canadian children because, quite frankly, they behave better than most Conservative MPs. Between partisan games and a speaker controversy, how are politicians leaving Parliament as they prepare to break for the holidays? That's next on The National. Parliament is set to break for the holidays after a chaotic sitting between Conservatives forcing votes and partisan games. We are going to put in thousands of amendments at committee and in the House of Commons, forcing all night round the clock voting. I think they need to, you know, have a moment to reflect on their behaviour and to think about whether this is how they really want to represent their constituents, by bringing in silly partisan games. And an ongoing controversy with the Speaker, what is the state of Parliament as MPs head back to their writings. Okay, let's bring everybody back to break it down. Chantal, Andrew, and Althea, all with me here in person in Toronto. I, I think it just means that they all need to go home for a bit. Like, that's where we're at the point where we need a reset, but perhaps it tells us a, a bigger story about um, the toxicity of Parliament, attitudes in Parliament, whether anything serious can get done there. Chantal, you want to start? Uh, <clears throat> well, serious things do get done and did get done. Yep. So it's not as if Parliament was paralyzed and no legislation was passed right. uh, or no conversations were had. Uh, some of the more interesting conversations, the one we had on Israel, uh, the Conservatives are taking a pass on. Uh, it's interesting to see where they go on Ukraine uh, because their behavior has been strange. But I do think that this last bit of um, vote marathon uh, is uh, the Canadians are turning, tuning it off. Sure. Uh, Christmas is coming. No one is taking it seriously. It's not as if, you know, there's a deadline and a life and death issue that uh, Parliament is divided over. I think the Conservatives could have spared themselves uh, the game playing. It may bring in money. Maybe. To the party coffers. But yeah. beyond that, uh, it, um, I think it goes against their efforts to show themselves as a government in waiting. It also, um, from, from the people I spoke to, certainly energized the Liberals in a way I hadn't seen before. Maybe because they didn't get any sleep and maybe because they were happy to see the boss for a long period of time. Like, I don't know what it was about, but it did energize them, I think, in a way that Conservatives didn't expect. Well, and maybe that abacus poll uh, sure. also. Now, it's just one poll. Yeah. Yes. Very uh, much so. so, you know, 5% swing, maybe that's exaggerated. But what's more interesting to me was some of the sort of the, the cross tabs, as they say in the business in there, some of the more uh, uh, probing questions they asked people. And one of the aspects of which was, when you go, as the Conservatives have gone, from 32 to 40% in such a hurry, uh, those new arrivals are very different voters than yes. the ones that you had at 30 percent that yeah. stuck with They're you. They're not your hardcore thick supporters, thick. yeah. And some of the antics that you do that, that, that bring in the, 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 the donations and, and rev up that, that hardcore base is going to give some of those voters a bit of pause. And I think you may have been seeing first signs of that. You know, it took some doing. They had to do about three or four different debacles, frankly. Uh, before it, I think it really registered with people. But you know, this is the kind of thing where people, there's a large block of voters who would like to see the back of Justin Trudeau and the Liberals, uh, but some section of those are going to say, well, wait a minute, what am I getting into with, yeah. with the new people? Yeah, Althea. Uh, so the abacus poll 
is interesting because there's still a 10-point spread. Let's, yeah. let's not <laughs> make it sound no like the liberals are on an up swing. Although some liberals seem to be treating it <laughs> yes, that way. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, but it's the appetite for change and the people who still believe the government is on the wrong track hasn't changed. So it's people who looked at the conservatives and said, oh, I'm not sure that you're who I thought I was. Mm -hmm. And I agree. I think Ukraine has been hugely beneficial for the liberals. This was a vote to send the free trade deal to committee. Mm -hmm. and it's not part of the estimates. It's not a confidence vote. And the conservatives say that they voted against it solely because it included language on price and carbon. Now, Ukraine, we've already talked about this, has a price on carbon. So it doesn't make any sense. And I know that this was communicated to Mr. Polyev's and his team, yet this is a decision that they made. And because the leader hasn't been perhaps as firm as some, like Andrew would have liked him to be, there is this impression left out there that maybe he's dog whistling to a bunch of I, I'm, Republican I'm people. I'm more persuaded of that now than I was before. They brought out Michael Chong and yeah. James Bazan yes. to make the, In statements the and denan yeah. the, to yeah. say we, yeah. we stand four square with Ukraine. Yeah. Why didn't they bring out uh, the leader? Well, and these were the two that actually suggested that they should vote for the bill. But the other thing I wanted to say about the filibuster, I love filibusters. I love parliamentary procedures. You're probably the only person uh, <laughs> in like, the world. But who when you do filibusters, <laughs> you should show up to the filibuster. <laughs> and the reason that it energized the liberals and to the dismay of most conservative uh, MPs, their leader wasn't there with them. So it wasn't... He was, there, he was there for parts. He was there for parts, to be fair yes. to him. Justin Trudeau was there way more than... <laughs> and even yes. most conservative MPs were not even in yes. the House. Yes. They were voting on their apps. Yes. So if you're going to have an exercise like that to make a big show about you're forcing people to stay in the House, yes. you should be there too. Yes. But I also think uh, setting aside the, the Ukraine issue, but going to the carbon pricing... Yes. Uh, I think the, the conservatives overplayed their hand. They had a win with the carve-outs yes. that Justin yes. Trudeau yes. agreed to. But by being so obsessed with anything, like we, we want the world not to have carbon yes. pricing was yes. basically their position on yes. Ukraine. They have turned the spotlight on the absence of any pl serious plan to deal with climate change. Uh, and it looks like they think they're going to be able to go in an election and say, We've said no to every possible approach to a strategy on yeah. climate change, including the latest, uh, a cap on emissions. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't matter because you are broke and it's Justin Trudeau's fault. I'm not sure that's going to work. I'm not sure it won't. Uh, uh, it, certainly, <laughs> it certainly hasn't worked for them in the past, very clearly. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure whether the next election is going to be, the public's going to be in the same it Depends where the economy mood. is, probably. Right? I think yeah. that same Abacus poll showed that, and I know it sounds contradictory, showed that even as conservative-minded voters uh, were against a carbon tax, more of them wanted a serious plan to tackle climate yeah, change yeah. from the Because they think they're not paying for it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But the point is... Yeah. Nobody Last would have known that there was anything to do with carbon pricing no. in the free trade deal with Ukraine if 100%. they hadn't said anything. Yeah. Right. So they should have just let it go to committee, and if they have something they want to amend yeah. from the deal, yeah. do it yeah. there. Yeah. They've created their own problem. And talked more about the carve-out and hit the government over that for weeks on end. Okay, well, there you go. It was nice to see you. It's glad, nice you're to all, see you. glad you're all here. And with that, I'll throw things back, of course, to Adrian, And she's also in Toronto. It's so nice to see you, too. Thank you, Rosie. Next, parts of Vancouver are going dark, Take thanks to some sneaky squirrels. We didn't believe until we saw it. We opened the door and we looked down and we're like, holy, the whole line was missing. A BC neighborhood tormented by a rash of light bulb robberies in our moment. Well, this grainy image is believed to be one of the culprits involved in a wave of light bulb thefts plaguing an East Vancouver neighborhood. Police describe the suspect as about 9 to 12 inches in length with a very bushy tail. So residents say they're fighting back against the pesky thieves, but they're finding the rodents to be quite persistent. The squirrely crime spree is our moment. Oh my God, I can't believe it's squirrels. <laughs> We came home one day and looked at our camera and noticed a squirrel popping in and just chewing off the light bulb. We didn't believe until we saw it. We opened the door and we looked down and we're like, holy, the whole line was missing. We noticed a couple of them missing within the week. 
they were all gone. And so we bought all new lights and put them up. And then we went away for four days and they were pretty much all gone. But yeah, I was like waging war. It was my mission. I was pretty aggressively using everything I could find, like weird, like all natural rodent sprays. I even ordered decoy owls. I tried, I tried, I tried, I lost. So we have no lights anymore. I thought they'd get electrocuted. I just think it's wild, it's hilarious. You can't eat them and they're big compared to nuts. Tough times, I guess, if they're stealing light bulbs. <laughs> what yeah. message do you have for these squirrels? Get the f out of here. Am I allowed to say that? Uh, I'm not sure you are, actually. Um, here's a theory. They're not interested in light bulbs at all. It's just, potentially, the soya coating on the wires leading to the light bulbs. This happens with cars, too, incidentally. That's a whole other story. From all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrienne Arsenault. Take care.